hear that you guys have been talking about relationships. Is that right? Yes. Now, uh, relationships look like many things. We've got marriage, we've got dating, we've got friends, we've got parents, we've got siblings. It can look like any number of things. But as I was, you know, just sitting on the topic of relationships, I just feel like the Lord burdened my heart with the most important relationship that we could ever have in our entire life. And if you know him, you probably know what that is. <laughs> and that is our relationship with Jesus. It does not matter how you look at it. It doesn't matter how many relationships you have in your life. No matter the way you look at this topic of relationships, I promise you, if you do not already know this, that there is no relationship in your life that is more important than the one that we have with Jesus Christ. And just like our relationship with other people, it doesn't just happen. You know, you can't just click your fingers and suddenly you have this super healthy, super thriving relational world. It actually takes intention. It takes us to reflect. We need to be deliberate, right? We know this with just our normal relationships that we have around us. But um, how much more so the most important relationship that we have in our lives, our relationship with God? And so I actually felt to pause, um, not pause the conversation of our relationship with others, but to actually just go back to the beginning where uh, uh, our relationship with others, uh, or sorry, with our relationship with God. So, because we want to reflect God into our relationships, right? But we can't do that if we don't know the one that we're revealing, right? You can't reveal to somebody else what hasn't been revealed first to you. You can't show a light that you personally have not experienced. You can't reflect somebody that you are not in line with. And there is one thing to accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our lives. And it is actually another thing to step into a close friendship and intimacy with the one who died for you. There's actually a difference. And I guess like where I want us to go today is really to just pull apart what it is to have a close relationship with Jesus, to have a friendship with him. Because if we want to reflect God to our worlds, we need to get this one right. <laughs> we need to be uh, listening to him and talking to him and actually prioritizing uh, our relationship with God as the first thing. In fact, not just the first thing, the one thing. And that's actually the title of my message today. If you are taking notes, we're going to talk about the one thing. And so I want to start off by reading a passage of scripture in Matthew 22, verses 34 to, to 40. And it says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, we just read what could be arguably one of the most famous passages of Scripture. Uh, a lot of people know it. A lot of people have heard it. It's the greatest commandment. And it's rightfully so, a very big deal <laughs> because Jesus himself says that this is the thing to remember. And so the, the experts and the teachers of the law have all gathered around. They're trying to bait Jesus. They're trying to catch him. They're trying to catch him out. And so they ask, you know, like, what is the one thing? What is the one thing that we need to remember? You've done a lot of things. You've said a lot of things. There's like 600 and something, something commandments. Like if I was to walk away from this moment with one thing to remember, what is it? That's essentially the question that they're asking. What is the most important thing? And so Jesus replies with love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Jesus is essentially saying to us that if you remember nothing else, remember this. What he wants more than anything is your love. What Jesus wants more than anything is your love. Have you guys ever got the wrong order? 
like when when you like go through the drive through or something. Yeah, like surely that's happened to not just me. But I want you to think about this. So there is one thing that I love food-wise more than anything. I'm going to I feel like I can share this with you guys. I love KFC. Now, the reason <laughs> oh, I've got some KFC fans back there. That's good to know. Now, my dad, okay, he is like one of those like no sugar guys. I don't know why this happened. He's just he's just like really strict with his food. And so I actually grew up thinking that I hated KFC because he would tell me that we hated KFC. And so I don't know if I've just like done a massive pendulum and like one day when I was a teenager I actually tried KFC and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so good. My dad lied to me. So I possibly have done like a massive pendulum. But I get the same thing every single time I go to KFC. And it is a Zinger Burger combo meal with a Pepsi. And that, when I go through the drive through that is what I have in mind. And that is the thing that I want. But I want you to imagine with me that, you know, we've just had a really late night at our next gen, what is, what's this called? Youth and... Youth and young and young adults event, okay? And I haven't had dinner. I'm starving. And so I have it in my mind that I'm going to go through that KFC drive through and I'm going to get a Zinger burger, right? I go through. I've reached the window. They open it. The smell of chicken just wafts through. It's, it's a really good time. And I'm just getting more excited for what I want. And then the guy comes and hands me this bag and I open it and it's like a bread roll. And like maybe some mashed potato and gravy. You know, I, who knows that I'm going to be turning to this guy and being like, hey, this isn't what I ordered. <laughs> this isn't what I wanted. Because I had something specific in mind that I wanted. And I wasn't going to stop until I got that thing, right? And so, and it doesn't matter if this guy is now turning to me and he's saying, Kate, you just smell the bread roll. It's really, really, really good. And you know what? I just took the mashed potato out of the box. Trust me, you haven't tried anything like this before. It doesn't matter how many times he tries to convince me that this is what I want. I have something in mind and I know what I want. Yeah. And so I'm going to be sending that thing back and I'm going to be demanding that I get my Zinger Burger combo meal with a Pepsi. Are you with me? Love it. But we understand this with food. But do we understand this with God? Do we, did you know that there is actually something that God wants most from your life? And that is your unrestrained love. That is your extravagant love. That is your heart. And I get it, right? Because so much of the time we try and fill our lives and we try and, you know, interact with God in a way uh, where we give him what we think that he wants. So I might give him or bring him my sacrifice. I might bring him my performance. I might bring him my discipline. Hello. I might bring him all of my good works, all of my good deeds. I might even bring him my serving roster. I might even bring him my church attendance on a Sunday or a Friday. And I bring him all of these things. And you know what? Most of those things that I just listed, they're actually not bad things. A lot of them are actually really good things. But it's just not the thing he asked for the most. And we spend so much time putting all of our attention, all of our energy, all of our effort into these baskets and neglect the one that he actually asked for, which was our love. That is the thing that he's after in Counter City, your radical, devoted, unrestrained love. So my question today isn't, do you come to church? My question today isn't how many rosters do you serve on? Do you have it all together? These aren't my questions. My question is, is Jesus your one thing? Is he the one and only thing in your heart? Is he, where, is he what you long for? Is, he, is his presence what you yearn for? When you go to do your quiet time during the week, is it simply discipline or is it actually desire? Because there is a difference between delighting in somebody and tolerating somebody. There is a difference between ticking a box and actually taking joy and delight in the person that you are meeting. We have friends and then we have acquaintances. 
We have people we're obligated to hang out with, let's be real, <laughs> right? But then there are the people that we would drop anything to go and hang out with. Why? Because we love them. Because we delight to be with them. And did you know that that is what Jesus is asking for? He's not asking for all of these boxes to be ticked. He's not asking for your perfection. He's not asking for your your performance or your discipline. He's asking for your love. Do you delight in the presence of God? Does your heart actually echo Psalm 27 verse 4? Just as David wrote when he said, This one thing I ask for, this one thing I seek to dwell in the house of the Lord forever and to gaze upon his beauty. Do you gaze upon the Lord's beauty? Because no relationship in your life is ever going to be enough until Jesus is your one thing. Nothing in your life is ever going to be enough until Jesus is the one thing. So today... I want to just briefly talk to you guys about a couple, like, there's a lot of elements, but I want to talk about two elements today that I feel the Lord laid upon my heart um, about, like, uh, keys or elements to intimacy and to actually developing that love and that close relationship with God. Does that sound okay? Amazing. So the first point is our time. Everyone say our time. Our time. We're going to read a passage of scripture. It's in Exodus uh, 34, and we're going to read from verse 29 to 30. And it says, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin on his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses and behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. See, Moses is a pretty awesome guy in the Bible. He's seen some pretty crazy stuff. Like if you follow that journey that Moses takes, you'd be like, this guy has seen some things, right? You know, you go to to, uh, the exit out of Egypt where there are like signs and wonders and miracles. He had this massive encounter with God where it was a burning bush, but the bush did not burn. The, uh, The Israel, he'd seen them like a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night actually led. He'd seen, you know, quail and manna appear out of nowhere. We're talking crazy miracles, guys. This guy has seen some things. But none of those things made his face shine. None of those things made Moses' face shine. It was only when he went up to the mountain and talked with God and had this intentional time that was carved out with him where he enabled him to carry the glory. Because there is a difference between seeing a lot of awesome things, being a part of an amazing move of God, and actually having depth with God. There is a difference. Depth with God looks like gradually and suddenly. It looks like slow and fast. It looks like secrets and public testimonies. It looks like feelings and conviction. It looks like hearing his voice and and, and following his promptings. Because a relationship with God is dynamic. And there is a difference between seeing a lot of awesome things and being a part of a lot of awesome things and actually having depth with him. It may sound simple, guys, but actually so often spending time with Jesus is the thing that most of us neglect. And I get it. We're busy, right? We're so busy. We have so many things going on. We have church. We have family. We have friends. We have work or uni. We have sport. Our time is not an unlimited resource, which is why how we spend our time actually reveals and reflects what we place value on. And so I just want to encourage you today that there is no substitute for your personal time with Jesus because no one else is going to make your face shine. No one else is going to satisfy your soul. No one else is going to be able to give you what you need. 
No one else knows you like he knows you. And nobody else is better company. No amount of serving, no amount of sacrificing, and no amount of good deeds is actually able to substitute your personal time with God. And so if we're all this way and we're not this way, we're going to burn out real quick. Let's not confuse intimacy with God with activity. That's the whole story of Mary and Martha, right? If you've heard that one before. Mary and Martha, siblings, welcome Jesus into their home. Martha busies herself waiting upon Jesus, cooking, cleaning, doing all of the things that need to get done. Whereas Mary just makes the decision to park herself at Jesus' feet and listen and chat with him. And then when Martha explodes, which happens, and she's like, Jesus, tell Mary to help me. She's not doing anything. Jesus goes, whoa, 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 Martha, Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Don't get me wrong. I love serving. I love serving in the house of God. I love doing things for God. It is like my passion, you know. I love being activated in the church and activated in our world. But when we replace serving for intimacy with God, we've got a problem. There is no substitute for your personal time with God. And if you want to build depth, if you want to build intimacy, if you want to know him in a way that is actually dynamic, then you cannot substitute it with anything else but sitting at his feet and listening to his word. Does that make sense? Are you following me? Amazing. Point number two is our treasure. Our treasure. You see, when you really love somebody, they don't get part of you, they get all of you. My husband, Josh, doesn't get my Monday, but not my Tuesday. (laughs) Right? That makes sense. We know that. He doesn't get my attention, but not my money. He doesn't get my mom, and not my brother. (laughs) He gets it all. He gets all of me because he's my husband right? And to develop intimacy with God, we actually have to be prepared to make every space in our life available to him. It means that no space is a no-go space. Everything is out in the open. God, you can do whatever you want. It means he gets your time. He gets your career. He gets your relationships. He gets your sexuality. He gets your money. He gets your goals and your dreams for the future. He gets your disappointments. He gets your unforgiveness towards that person. He gets your trauma. He gets your fears and embarrassments. He gets your porn addiction. And he gets your anger outbursts. He gets everything. Because intimacy, you can't have like true intimacy if you're holding at an arm's length away. It's like you can have this, but you can't have this. You following me? You know, when Jesus replied to the teachers of the law when he was talking about, you know, the greatest commandment, it was to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. Everyone say all. All. Not part, not most, but all of it. And you see, this world is going to try and claim parts of your life that should exclusively belong to the Lord. Part of intimacy is actually being exclusive. No other person or thing would get a part of your heart that is reserved for God alone. Let me take you on a journey. (laughs) So I love my husband. I think he's the best. And I would say that I extravagantly love him. And I do my best to show him that I extravagantly love him. And so he's a real quality time guy. And so I, you know, spend lots of time with him. I buy him gifts sometimes. He loves sport. And so, you know, we turn the TV on and I just leave him be for hours and hours. And that is part of my way of showing him that I love him, right? Uh, He also loves food. So I do a lot of cooking. I do a lot of baking, you know, and all of it. I do a lot of washing too. I do all of these things to try and show my wonderful husband that I extravagantly love him, that he, I love him more than I love anybody else in this world except for Jesus, 
right? So all of my actions and everything I do is pointed this direction of saying, Josh, I love you and you can have all of these things and I pray and hope that he feels extravagantly loved by me. But who knows that one day if I walk up to him and I say, Josh, I'm going to do all of these things for you. Nothing is going to change, not a single thing except for one. I'm just going to have this other boyfriend on the side um, and, uh, he, you know, he can have Tuesday nights. Who knows that suddenly my extravagant love for Josh has become null and void simply because it's no longer exclusive. It's like, I did everything that I was doing before. I will still shower you with presents. I will still make you food. I'll still let you watch sports. I'll spend time with you and say nice things to you. I'll do all the things I did before. The only thing is, I'm just also going to have this other guy. Now, don't worry. There's no other guy. Um, But we know, just even through that story, there's something in our heads and in our minds that know that the moment... It's not exclusive. It's not extravagant. It's no longer all simply because I have this other thing. And to love with all of our heart means forsaking everything else except for the one thing. Steph, how much time do I have? I don't know what time I'm supposed to finish. I've got plenty of time. Okay, that's good. Um, to, yeah, to develop intimacy with God. We actually have to be prepared to make every area of our life available to him. To actually be our Lord, be our saviour, be our redeemer. Jesus needs to be our one thing. Everyone say one thing. One One more passage of scripture. Um, Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. It's the story of the rich young ruler. And as he went, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud and honor your mother and your father. And he said to him, teacher, all of these things I have kept since my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. You see, this man, he wanted to follow God. He had a desire and he said, what do I need to do? And so, you know, all these commandments, all these things, I have kept these things. What do I have to do? What else is there? And Jesus told him to go and sell all of his possessions to the poor. And you know what? Jesus didn't tell him to do this because there was like a homeless crisis right? He didn't do this because he wanted uh, specifically to deal with the, all the homelessness and the neediness around. That wasn't his goal. He did it because he knew that there was one singular area that he was unwilling to give. He wanted to follow, but when push came to shove, he was unwilling to make God his one thing. Because being, Jesus being the one thing means forsaking all others. For him, it was finances. But for you, it could be your career. It could be your sexuality. It could be a particular relationship that you need to release forgiveness in or actually a particular relationship you need to let go of. It could be watching pornography. It could be the jealous and manipulative behaviours. There are things in our life, myself included, we don't make it, that we actually need to allow God to actually come and minister and meet with us in so that all parts of our life and all of our heart is for him. You see, you can't love him with all of your heart until all of your heart is actually his. Now, 
like I said, we're going to be going on this journey for the rest of our lives. And, you know, I might actually um, get the keys to come back up if I could. Thank you. We're going to be doing this journey for the rest of our lives. And I stand here very much on the same journey as every single one of you. We all have things we lift up to other idols and lift up to other spaces. But what I really feel God wants to do in here today is to light the first love flame in your heart. You know that the, when we say first love, it's like when you first met Jesus and you realize how much he loves you and you realize how much he did for you before we got busy trying to add everything, trying to do everything, trying to earn it, trying to be good enough, trying to be disciplined enough, trying to do enough good. I really believe that today there's actually a grace and an anointing in this place to fan into flame that first love again, where it's like, your love is all he wants. He's not looking for all of the other stuff that we like to think. He just wants your love. He just wants your affection. He just wants your adoration. He just wants you to behold him. And we tire ourselves out time and time and time again, trying to give Jesus what we think that he wants instead of the very thing that he's asked for. We want to be people that don't just know Jesus in our head or say the sinner's prayer one time, but don't actually have this living, alive relationship with him that's dynamic and close and more real than you guys are in front of me. (laughs) You see... Jesus is my best friend. And I know that can sound a bit, you know, whatever, but it's true. It's true. He saved me and he set me free from the darkest spots and the darkest places in my own life. And time and time again, I've seen him just extend out his hand and rescue person after person and situation after situation and moment after moment because he's just so good. And I just love him so much. And it doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter how it looks. Because my love for him overpowers my own dignity. And that's what real love is. That's what happens when you're intimate and close. And, you know, it overpowers every reason why not. And I just believe today, like, you know, later on, like, we're going to go into some ministry time. And I just, like, feel like God wants to birth a fresh fire in you where, where your love for him is consuming, where he is the one thing that you think about, where, where you realize that um, there are actually some things in your life that you have been withholding from him. Maybe it's because of a lack of trust. Maybe it's because it's your treasure and you're just trying to hold on to it. I don't know. But I I just sense that there's nothing, there's no situation that we face in our life that doesn't find its way forward in intimacy and encounter with God. And so whatever you might be facing, whatever you might be feeling, whatever the Holy Spirit even has his finger on in your life right now, I'm telling you that there is nothing, there's no like, there's no issue so big that we can't find our resolve and our way forward through a moment and intimacy with Jesus. And so, you know what? We're going to pray for people soon. Um, But before we do, I just want to talk to the room today and specifically to anyone in here who you actually don't have a relationship with Jesus in the first place. Um. You've come, maybe you've come here today like for the first time or maybe you've been here for a while and you've never um, even, you know, really heard about this Jesus guy or maybe you've heard about it a million times. But I just want to like encourage you that the decision to follow Jesus is the single best decision you will make with your entire life. I made it when I was 13. I was 13, didn't grow up in a Christian household um, and I was anxious and depressed and 
uh, things were just messy and confusing and I was just trying to figure out my way through this world with no knowledge of God. And then I walked into a youth group similar to this and um, I heard the message of Jesus Christ. And from that moment on, my life has never been the same because he has done everything that he said that he would do. And he continues to show me day after day after day how it really is, how much he loves me, and how much he isn't what I always thought he was. <laughs> he's my father. He's my savior. He's my best friend. He's so real. He heals. He delivers. He sets free. He set me free from fear. I was so socially anxious. I, like when I was in primary school, I had a period of probably six months where I couldn't even leave the house because I was so anxious. I lived in my home for six months, not leaving at all because I was that anxious. And you know what? Time went on and I still wasn't doing that much better. And the only thing that freed me? Jesus. I would throw up before public speaking. But you know what freed me? Jesus. <laughs> He's so, so good. And you know what? The gospel message, it's, it's, really, it's really this simple. We, you and me, fall short. We have sin in our life. We chose to do our own thing and to live our own way. And because God is holy and perfect and wonderful, he couldn't be in the presence of sin. But he didn't like being separated from us. And so he made a plan. <laughs> And the plan was that he was going to come to earth in the form of Jesus, the son, fully God, but also fully man. And he was going to live a perfect life, which he did, only to end up dying a criminal's death on the cross as the punishment for your wrongdoing and mine. He never did anything wrong. He was completely perfect, completely wonderful. He loved, he healed, he delivered, and still they put him on a cross to die. They spat on him, they mocked him, they beat him. And still he hung on that cross and he died. And it wasn't, it, it was because he loved you. And it was because he wanted to take the punishment for your sin and my sin. And then three days later, Jesus rose from the dead and he actually defeated death and sin once and for all. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Once and for all, death lost its sting. Sin was overcome. And he said that all you have to do to have your sin washed away isn't behave really good. It isn't to work really hard and attend church every single Sunday. All you have to do, believe. Believe and follow. Believe and follow. And so today, I actually just would love everyone to close your eyes across this whole place. I just want to invite any person who, you know, doesn't actually have a relationship with Jesus or maybe um, you're here for the first time or, you know, maybe you've been here for a little while, but you've never made the decision to welcome Jesus into your heart and into your life and to be your Lord and Savior. And you want to make that decision today. You want what I've been talking about. You want the freedom you want the deliverance. You want the love to come and fill your heart. You want the healing and the power of God. I'm telling you, all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And I believe the Holy Spirit is going to come and minister to you. And so if that's you and you want to make a decision today to put your faith and trust in Jesus, I'm going to count to three. And I just want you to slip up your hand, kind of like you're in a classroom. Everyone's eyes are closed. And then you can, I'll acknowledge it. You can put it down. And then afterwards, we're going to pray a prayer together that, um, that just welcomes Jesus into your heart. And so if that is you, on the count of three, just lift up your hands. 
three, two, one. Awesome. I see that hand over there. So good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So good. Hey, is there anyone else here today? You want to make the decision to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Maybe your heart's pounding in your chest. Maybe you're just like, I wish she would hurry up and finish this moment. (laughs) That's the Holy Spirit knocking on the door of your heart. I don't want to rush this moment. I'm going to give you a couple more a couple more seconds, if that's you, and you want to put your faith and trust in Jesus. Thank you, Lord. All right, for that um, that one person that made this decision tonight, um, we're going to pray a prayer all together. And for that person who did, I just want um, you to just mean this with your heart and confess it with your mouth. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And he's going to minister to you. Um, and yeah, this is actually like such a defining moment for you. And so everyone, let's repeat after me and say, Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I welcome you today into my heart to be my Lord and Savior and Father and friend. Would you help me to live for you and follow you all the days of my life? Wash my sin clean. I love you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.